Hey everyone, we're leading, reading Little Britches. Father and I were ranchers. Chapter 11 and 12 today. Chapter 11, Haying. I liked working for Fred Altland. Haying and threshing were big times at his place, and he always had a dozen or so men to help him. So some of them were neighbors who didn't have so much hay of their own, and some were hired hands Fred brought out from Denver. Father and I didn't work for him until the hay was all cut and raked into windrows. I had never seen a hay stacker before, and Father had to snap his fingers at me twice during the morning because I got so interested in what was going on that I forgot about my own job. Fred's was what they called a bull stacker, and the hay was brought in from the fields with bull rakes. They were sort of three-wheeled carts and always looked so always looked as though they were going backwards because they scooped up the hay and carried it to the stacker in front of the horses instead of behind them. Each load weighed nearly half a ton. The stacker looked like the mast of a ship mounted on a big turntable with a long boom fastened near the bottom of it. The cradle was hinged to the end of the boom and pulley ropes ran between it and the top of the mast. Jeff was the engine that furnished the lifting power and I was the engineer. Jeff was a big, lazy old horse, strong as a pair of oxen, and he had been pulling the hoist rope for the past five years. As Jeff pulled on the rope, the hay was raised from the bull rakes and lifted nearly to the top of the mast. Then, while we held it there, Father and another man heaved the turntable around with a long G-pole till the cradle was over the stack. When I backed Jeff to slacken the hoist rope, the cradle tilted forward and the, road, and the load fell with a thump. It took Fred and two other men to get it untangled and built into the stack before another load was brought in. The only hard part of Father's job was heaving the turntable around, but that made him cough a good deal. After the first couple loads, he talked to Fred about the stacker and had they sent a man to the barn for tools and other things Father needed. He worked between loads all morning, changing pulleys, rigging a heavy cable from the turntable to hoist the rope, and pulling trip catches on the cradle. When he was finished, they didn't need to heave the turntable around anymore, nor lift the hay any higher than the top of the stack, and Father could drop the hay whenever Fred wanted it. By just jerking it, jerking a trip cord, in that way only, in that way Fred only needed one man to help him on the stack, and Father could do all the work on the ground alone. I liked noon times best of any part of the haying. When it was twelve o'clock, Bessie came would hammer on an old wagon tire hung near the kitchen door. The sound would roll out across the hayfields like the ringing of a big bell, and after it had stopped, the echo would come back from the hills as though they were full of far-off churches. The minute the bell rang, the drivers would stop their teams wherever they happened to be and hunt, unhook the horses. It was always a race to see who could get his team to the barn quickest, so as to get them unbridled and fed. To be first at the washstand. It was only by the window, windmill, and Bessie always had three blue enamel basins, half of a dozen flour sack towels, and a bar of homemade yellow soap waiting for us. Altlands had a big porch on the east side of their house with a row of apple trees to sh that shaded it. In haying and threshing time, Bessie set a long table out there, and that's where we ate our dinners. At home, Father always served everyone and said grace before we started to eat, but that wasn't the way they did it at Altlands.
as soon as we were done, we were down at the table, Bessie would start bringing out big platters of meat and fried chicken and potatoes and vegetables and bowls of gravy and plates of hot biscuits and corn muffins. As quick as she'd set a platter down, somebody would pick it up, help himself and pass it on the next man. Then came so they came so fast that I could hardly help myself from one before another one caught up to me. Some of the platters were still pretty heavy when they got to me, and I could just barely hold them with one hand while I forked some off with the other. At first, the men wanted to hold them for me, but they saw I didn't like them to, and they and let me handle my own platters. Mrs. Altland was a great deal, a real good cook, and I used to eat until I couldn't hold another mouthful. The most fun came after we were done eating. We had to take an hour for dinner because the horses needed that much time to rest, eat and rest. So as soon as the last piece of pie was eaten, the men would lie down on the grass under the apple trees. Father didn't smoke, but all the other men would get out their pipes and, or bull durham and talk or tell stories while they were smoking. Jerry Adler was the best storyteller. Sometimes he told stories so quiet I could hardly hear them, and they didn't sound funny at all, but all the men would laugh till the fat ones had to hold on to their stomachs. Even father laughed sometimes when I couldn't see anything funny. It was one, uh, it was one of those noons that I found out about pheasants. There were lots of them, and they were so tame they'd come almost up to the haystack. I wanted to do some of the talking after dinner as the men did. So one noon, I told Fred that I had a gun I could shoot some of those pheasants to use to eat. And then his mother wouldn't have to kill so many chickens. Everybody laughed at me, and Fred said, If you're going to do any shooting in Colorado, shoot a man. You can always call it self-defense, but if you, call, if you kill a pe pheasant, you'll spend the rest of your life in the ho hose gal. Fred Altland's hay lasted two weeks, Sundays and all. I rem remember the last day that haying better than any of the others because so many things happen. The last day of haying or for harvest or threshing is always the day when the most things happen. Maybe it's because everybody's happy if you had a good luck. And if you didn't, everybody's glad it w it's over, over with. There was a fight after dinner that noon. One of the young fellows Fred brought out from dinner said something about Bessie that Jerry Adler, Adler did not like. She had her back to us and was picking up the dishes and she was leaning over so far that her dress was real tight against her bottom. The Denver fellow was right, looking right at it. Then he winked at Jerry before he said whatever it was. Anyway, it was an awful hard fight. The Denver fellow was the biggest man on the job and Jerry was the biggest and the next biggest. The first sock, Jerry hit him. Bessie ran into the house and all the men got up on their feet, but nobody tried to stop them. The other two Denver fellows were nearest to where they were fighting. Fred and Carl Henry went over and stood by them, but they didn't say anything. The big Denver man didn't hit so often as Jerry did, but he hit a lot harder. He took a longer swing, and once he hit Jerry under the ear and knocked him down, I thought he was going to kick him while he was down, but Fred stopped in quick, and he didn't. Jerry rolled over and got right up again, and from there on, he fought just like a collie dog. He used his feet just about as much as he did his fists, but he didn't do any kicking like the other fellow. He'd go in quick and hit, and be out again before the bigger fellow could hit back. And he went around that Denver man like a fly going around a late a lamp chimney. I guess the big fellow got kind of dizzy, turning round and round, trying to catch up with Jerry, because he started looking pretty groggy. Then, all at once, 
Jerry flew in with both arms working like a pitman, pitman rod on a mowing machine. He got his head right against the fellow, other fellow's wishbone and hammered him in the stomach, stomach till he went down yapping for air like a mud cat when he to you toss him up on the creek bank. After the fight, Fred took the three Denver fellows over to the bunkhouse and paid them off, but I didn't think he ever said anything to, at all to Jerry for fighting, and as soon as he had washed the blood off his face and got his breath, you wouldn't have known Jerry had been in a, a fight, except that his lips were kind of swelled up. He came back from the washstand and started to tell stories about almost before he had found a place to lie down under the apple tree. With three hands short, it was late before we had the last load of hay on the stack, so Father and I stayed at Altland's for supper. When we were through eating, Fred told us to come into the house with him. We sat down by the table in the dining room, and Fred got out his checkbook. I knew father didn't know how much he was going to get because I heard mother ask him and he said, I don't know. I think he's paying the men he got from Denver a dollar and a half a day, but they're quite a bit stouter than I am right now. I hadn't wanted to ask father what Fred meant when he told me he'd double the ante. So I didn't know how much I was going to get either, but I hoped he meant he was going to give me 50 cents a day. After Fred got the ink bottle and a pen, he sat down at the table with us and asked me if I wanted to have a separate check of if he should make one check for father and me together. For father and me together. Um, I wanted it to be a big enough check that we could buy a cow and I was proud to have my pay go in with father's so I said for him to just make one check. He looked up at Father and said, All right then, Charlie. That'll make it a round sum. I figure Spikes is worth twice what Liz Kukorin was giving him. And you've saved me the wagons of two men. Will $50 square the books? I was so excited I didn't even hear what Father said. And he had to tap me on the arm before I remembered to say thank you. Father was as anxious to get home and show Mother the check as I was. He walked so fast I had to trot part of the time to keep up with him. He hadn't gone very far before he noticed I was having to trot and scrooched down so I could get on and ride piggyback. I had always liked to have Father lug me piggyback before and we were far enough from Altland's house so that I wasn't afraid anyone could would see us. For that reason, I didn't want to be carried that night. It just didn't seem right to be carried home when we were taking the check I had helped earn. Father understood how I felt, and he walked slow enough so I didn't have to trot anymore and let me carry the check home to Mother in my overall pocket. There wasn't nearly as so much fun in giving it to her as I had thought, because when we got there, our old white horse, Bill, was sick. He was breathing so hard you could hear him all over the yard and was pounding his head on the barn floor. Father took one look at him and said, Blackwater, I'm afraid he's done for. Then he sent me kick kidding back to Otland's for a bottle of spirits of of nither N knitter okay chapter 12 i go after two dog okay the next morning i was up as soon as the first light peeped over loretta heights mrs kukorin had told me to come back to herd her cows right after hanging but i had a different idea in my head Bill was still just barely alive, and I was going to get Two Dog to come and save him. Before anybody else was up, I went out and sat beside our barn where we had sat the night he and Mr. Thompson stayed at our place. 
From there, I could get the best look at the mountains when the first sun struck them and before it got high enough to light the land before them and me. Mother had a stereoscope that you could put pictures into and move them over to make far off places come right up close. The early sun did the same thing to the mountains. I could shut my eyes and just and see just how two dogs' fingers had shown me the way to his camp, then opened them and traced the trail up through Turkey Creek Canyon, so it seemed almost as though I had actually been over it. I got up and swiped a quarter of oats, quart of oats for Fanny, so she could have them all cleaned up before Father came out to give the horses their regular breakfasts. By half past six, I started off up the road on Fanny as if I were going to the Cocorans, but I had three cold biscuits hidden in the front of my blouse. All spring, Father had talked about our driving up to the mountains some Sunday, but for one reason or another, we never did it. They looked as though they started out just a little way beyond the hill in Fred Altland's back pasture. Turkey Creek Canyon was quite a way south, and the most direct wagon road ran along the west e end of our place, past the schoolhouse and Carl Henry's. But I knew Father would never let me go alone, and I didn't want anybody to see me. So I headed west past Altland's wheat field, then cut southwest across country, straight from the V that marked the mouth of the canyon. I knew better than to run Fanny up hills, but I was so anxious to get to two dogs and the distance seemed so short that I lay tight down against his, her neck and we went up over Fred's big hill like a jackrabbit in front of a coyote. Looking from the top of that hill, I could see a, store, a series of others rising one beyond the other toward the hogbacks that stood before the real mountains. Until then, there had been, hadn't been any doubt in my mind that I could get to Two Dogs Camp without a mite of trouble. But with all those hills between me and the mountains, I began to get a little bit afraid, and I wondered if I shouldn't go back and talk to Father about it first. As soon as we were out of sight over the top of the hill, I stopped Fanny and let her catch her wind. The more I thought about Father, or about talking to father, the more sure I was that he wouldn't let me go. So I was just as sure that Two Dog was the only one in the world who could save Bill. So I kicked my heels against Fanny's ribs. At first there were crops in the valleys between the hills and a few ranch houses. So I had to ride miles out of my way to get around them. Every time we got to the top of one hill, there was another just beyond it, and the mountains didn't seem any nearer than they had from home. I knew Fanny had I knew Fanny was beginning to get tired because the hills were getting steeper and she was climbing slower. There were no more crop fields in the valleys, and I started riding around the hills instead of over them, so as to save Fanny a hard climbs. Two or three times we had we came to deep gulches that we couldn't get across and had to turn back and find another way. If it hadn't been for the mountains, I'm sure I would have been lost, but I knew their shapes well enough so that I could always tell where I was. I was getting close to moon noon it was getting close to noon, and the sun was bearing down like a hot stove lid when we came into a green valley, green little valley with a spring of cool water in it. We both drank all we could hold, and while Fanny grazed, I ate my biscuits. I must have squeezed them a bit because they were pretty well crumbled up, and some of the pieces were soggy with sweat, but I was hungry and they tasted all right. The sun was hanging low above the mountains when we came over to the la came over the last hill. I could see the break in the hogback where Turkey Creek had cut its gorge 
As we came closer, I could see there was a little used wagon road along the north bank of the creek. I locked Fanny toward it, and we followed it through the gorge and into the mouth of the canyon. The misgivings I had when we were on top of Fred Altland's hill were nothing to what I had when we came into the canyon. The creek ran through a narrow cut, narrow cut, and the walls seemed to rise straight up for a mile. From there, the sun had set and a cool breeze was drawing down between the cliffs. <clears throat> All I had on was my blue shirt and overalls, and after the heat among the hills, <clears throat> it made me shiver. I don't know whether I shivered more because I was cold or because I was frightened. I had never seen mountains that were more than big rolling hills, and it seemed to me that those black rock walls might fall on me any minute. Then I really began to be afraid I could never find Two Dogs Camp. I stopped Fanny and shut my eyes tight, trying to bring back the way he had pointed out the trail with his fingers. But all I could see was the big green blotch with black rock walls running up around it. As I sat down, I sat beside the barn with two dog a couple weeks ago, and again that same morning, I had been able to picture the trail just as I was sure it was going, but it was going to look, but it was all different now. For a minute or two, I was going to turn back. But a new night would come long before I could make it back, make it, and I could never hope to find my way home in the dark. I kicked my heels into Fanny's ribs, and we went on. The harder I tried to think how two dogs' fingers had moved, the more confused I got. In half an hour, it had been become darker and colder in the canyon. I couldn't remember that two dogs' fingers had shown the trail going in quite a way before it branched off, but he made, he had made them go straight while the trail wound in and out against the wall of the canyon. At last, I thought that if I could just be sitting down behind our barn again for a few minutes, I could remember it all right. But of course, I couldn't do that. So I slid off Fanny and sat down with my back against the canyon wall. I was so tired, I almost went to sleep and it must have been when I was just between being asleep and awake that it all came back to me. I could remember that he had shown the trail going up as though they were a, was a steep hill, and then aligning off to the right. I climbed back on Fanny and put her into a good stiff lope. It wasn't more than 10 minutes before we came around a shoulder of rock and the track climbed steeply up a shelf on the canyon wall. Just above the rise, the trail forked. The main track followed the shelf above the creek, but a thin thread of it turned up and up the side of a jagged cleft through the rocks to the, to the right. I had no question in mind and turned Fanny up the steep side trail the sun had sunk so low that I that it no longer shone on the top of the peaks above me, and I began to get panicky for fear black darkness would catch me, and we would fall to the bottom of the gorge if Fanny had if Fanny made a misstep. I dug my knees into her withers and kept her climbing so hard that it made me breathe whistle through her nose. We were nearly at the top of the climb when the whole air of the canyon was ripped to pieces by a sound that almost made my heart stop. It was a howl that seemed to come from nowhere in particular, but from everywhere out at once, as it echoed back and forth between the canyon walls. Cold shivers raced up and down my back, and it felt as though it were covered with stiff hair that was standing up as it does on a frightened dog. Fanny must have felt just the same way I did because her ears pinned back tight against her head and I could feel a tremble pass through her withers. She cowered close against the cliff and stood shaking. <clears throat> 
I started thinking about father and mother and the rest of the youngsters at home. I wanted to turn Fanny and race out of the canyon as fast as she could go, but when I looked down into the gorge, it was as black as a well. Though I had never heard a wolf's howl before, I had read about it and knew that was what I must have heard. I tried to remember the sound and see if I could figure out whether it came from or above or below, but I was so scared I couldn't think straight, and when I shut my eyes, I could see gray shadows racing up the trail behind me. That settled it. I kicked my heels into Fanny's ribs, and I tried to cluck to her, but my mouth was so dry that I made only a hissing sound. I think that was the first time Fanny ever trusted my judgment more than her own. <clears throat> she gathered her muscles and tore up the rest of the grade as though the wolf had her by the tail. We came out onto a flat rock ledge, raced across it, and were out onto a narrow path that wound through great boulders. Fanny was taking sharp turns of the path so fast that I had to hang on with every ounce of strength in my knees. We must have gone a mile or more that way. I could hear every breath she rasped through her, th her throat like tearing cloth. It was deep twilight when we came out into an open, little open field set in between tall, black-looking trees, and the path was gone. I sawed on the reins and pulled Fanny to a stop in the middle of the field. We stood shivering as though it were below zero. There wasn't a sound except for the rushing of Fanny's breath. The first thought that came into my head was timber wolves. I had read stories about their tearing wood choppers to pieces and turned Fanny to get back out of there the way we had come in. But I couldn't see, couldn't even see a gap in the wall of black trees. And I was so panicky, I couldn't remember whether there should be more uh, to the trail or not. Without even thinking what I was doing, I yelled, Two dog! at the top of my lungs. The sound came, sound came yodely like a coyote call. A second later, an oblong of light from an open doorway showed at the edge of the woods. And Mr. Thompson's voice called out, Hi there, little papoose. Mother used to sing a song about the golden gates of heaven, and that was what the yellow light coming out of the doorway reminded me of. I leaned forward a little bit on Fanny, and she went over there on, a, on the fly. I guess that light looked as good to her as it did to me. When I rode up to the door, Mr. Thompson told me to light down and come in while we he put Fanny in the corral. Okay. Here. At first, I didn't want to let him take her and ask if the wolves might not get her, but he just laughed and said, okay, um, she said, ain't saw a wolf round these parts in years. Set two dogs, old tame one. Always hollers when there's nobody on the trail and generally scares them off. That's how we knowed you was coming. Their house only had one small room and not a single window. It was made of poles on the front and, and, the so and sides and built right against a ledge so that the back wall was solid stone. The spaces between the poles were stuffed with hard baked adobe and straw. There wasn't any stove or chimney, but there was a cleft in the ledge about three feet deep that they used for a fireplace. It was wedge shaped and about as wide as it was deep at the bottom, but the narrow, top narrowed to less than a foot. The floor was partly flat rock and the rest hard dirt. There were two bunks at one end of the room, one above the other, but there weren't any bedclothes or mattresses. The springs were made of tightly stretched horse hide, horse hide and the covers were mountain goat skins with long white hair. The only furniture was a table and two stools. The table must have weighed a ton. It was nearly four feet wide, 
and had been made by splitting the butt of a log in two. The legs were heavy stakes driven into holes in the round side of the log. One stool sat on each side of the table. They were made the same way and didn't look as though they had ever been moved. Pieces of wagon iron, worn horse shoes, and harness hung on wooden pegs in the walls. Strips of dried meat and bunches of herbs were tied to a line in front of the fireplace. The only lamp was a bottle of fat with a rope, rope wick in it. It didn't have a chimney. Two Dog was sitting on the floor beside the fireplace with his back against the stone wall. He didn't get up when I came in, but his eye lit, eyes lit, lighted, and he held one arm toward me with the palm of his hand down. I didn't know how to shake hands with his palm turned down like that, so I just took hold of the ends of his fingers, then let go and sat down beside him. He didn't say a word, but reached over and laid his hand on my leg three times the way he did beside our barn. I, it was five or 10 minutes before Mr. Thompson came back from putting Fanny in the corral. I had plenty of time to show Two Dog how Bill was lying on our, yeah, lying on our barn floor with his back humped up, all humped up and how he was pounding his head and how he was breathing. I used to wonder if the reason Two Dog didn't talk wasn't because wasn't because Mr. Thompson talked enough for both of them. As soon as he came back from, from putting Fanny in, in the corral, Two Dog said about six words to him, kind of grunts. I guess it was Indian. Then Mr. Thompson began asking me questions faster than I could answer them. He wanted to know if father and mother knew I was coming up there and how I had found their place, and if my folks wouldn't be worried about me. All the time he was talking, talking, he kept fussing with something in a big black iron pot over the fire. While I was telling him, he took three dented old pie tins from the table and started ladling out the stew. It looked like rabbit stew, but the gravy was thick and brown. There was a covered iron kettle sitting on the floor by the fireplace. Mr. Thompson fished a few cold biscuits and three iron spoons out of it, put a biscuit and a spoon on each plate and gave one to Two Dog and one to me. Then he sat down on, on a stool with his plate beside him on the table. Mr. Thompson kept asking questions all the time between mouthfuls and telling me to hurry and eat my victuals so he could take me right home. I was really, I was real hungry and the stew was good. So I just let him talk till I had cleaned up my plate. Just as I had, I was slopping up the last of the gravy with my biscuit, Two Dog patted me on the leg again, nodded his head toward his plate and said, uh, skunk, good? For a minute, I thought I was going to be sick because I decided it was wouldn't hurt me if it didn't hurt them, and it stayed down all right, skunk. As soon as Mr. Thompson was through eating, he snatched up the stew pot and took it outdoors. I heard him clamping his hands before he came back. Two dog got up, took a coil of thin, skinny rope, from a peg on, in the wall and motioned for me to follow him out the door. Okay. As I did, my heart jumped into my throat and nearly stopped. A big gray wolf was eating from the iron pot. He was standing in the light that spilled through the doorway. And when he lifted his head, his eyes glowed like live coals. He snarled and the hair bristled on his shoulders but Two Dog grunted in him and he faded away into the shadow of the trees. The moon had risen and Two Dog led the way along the woods at the edge of the field to a pole corral at its far end. There was a break in the trees, so that moonlight flooded the corral and I could see nearly a dozen mean-looking horses inside it. 
Fanny and the two buckskins I had seen at our place were among them. They started milling when they saw us and crowded into their far end of the corral, snorting and rearing against the poles. Two Dog motioned me to stay outside while he crawled through the bars. He seemed so frail and old that I was sure they would kill him, but he walked straight toward them. As he went, he shook out a loop in the horsehair rope, holding it in one hand and letting it trail along behind him. He was almost to them when one of the horses whistled, and they all came racing toward him. I ducked my head without meaning to, and when I lifted it, Two Dog was snubbing one of the buckskins to a corral post. The buckskin kept, sorry, the buckskin jumped and reared, fighting the rope for a couple of minutes, but it didn't seem to worry Two Dog a bit. He waited for the bronc, bronc to calm down then led him to the gate and haltered him. I watched like a hawk when he caught the other buckskin, but I couldn't see how he did it. He, did any, he didn't any more than snap his wrist and forearm, but the rope leapt off the ground, passed over another horse's back, and came looping down around the buckskin's neck. It all happened in less than a second. After that, he caught Fanny the same way only he didn't have to snub her to a post. As soon as she felt the rope around her neck, she stopped dead still. Two dogs snapped his wrist again, and a loop that looked like a little barrel hoop ran up the rope and settled around her nose. Then he led her to the gate and put her bridle on. I started to climb up the poles to get to on her, but two dogs shook his head at me. There was a rawhide strap about an inch wide hanging on one of the corral poles. He cut a piece off it a little more than a foot long, sliced about half its length into three narrow strips and braided them into Fanny's mane, way back close to her withers. Then he showed me how to grab it with one hand and swing myself up so I could get an arm over her back. From there, it was easy to pull myself on, and Fanny wore the rawhide braided in her mane as long as she lived. Two Dog led the horses to the house, and when Tom Mr. Thompson came out with a harness, he was all dressed up in his calfskin vest, ten-gallon hat, and high-heeled boots. While he harnessed the horses, Two Dog went in and put on his black coat and derby. When he came back, he was holding a small leather pouch that rattled as if it had dry leaves in it. I don't remember much about the trip home that night. One minute I was listening to the drum beat of the buckskins running hoofs, and what seemed to be the next, Mr. Thompson was passing me over the wagon wheel into Mom, mother's arms, and she was crying. I was awfully sleepy, and I just remember having my head against her neck and telling her I was sorry as she was carrying me through the buck house, bunk house door. It was pretty late when father came and woke me. He sat on the edge of my bed and held me on his lap. Then he told me how wrong I, a thing I had done and that it had frightened mother so that he wouldn't be surprised if it took several years off her life. He said that every man in the neighborhood had been out riding the hills looking for me and that he thought Mother would have lost her mind if he hadn't made her believe Fanny would have come home alone if anything had happened to me. Then he said that wasn't really so because she might have broken a leg in a gopher hole and fallen on me. I don't remember Father ever kissing me any other time, but after he put me back in bed, he leaned over and kissed me right on the forehead. I didn't wake up to, up till late the next morning. When I did, Mr. Thompson and Two Dog were gone, and Bill was up on his feet, nibbling at a few wisps of alfalfa. Okay, till tomorrow.